Chapter 4 The First Cataract The Black World's New Borderline Having lost both Upper and Lower Egypt, Ethiopia's northern border had been pushed to the First Cataract at Aswan, and Nico II eventually became King of Egypt, beginning the 26th Dynasty, 664 to 525 BC. The Egyptian armies were increasingly made up of foreigners and enslaved blacks. It was during this dynasty that the Assyrians were expelled again, this time by nationalistic Egyptians. The blacks lost of their beloved Memphis, Thebes, and even their Egyptian name now seemed to be final. Other invasions were to come, however. The Persians under Darius the Great took over, and their domination of Egypt lasted from 525 to 404 BC, with the assistance of Greek mercenaries. They returned in 343 to re-establish their rule. Again, it was of relatively short duration. Alexander reached Egypt in 332 BC on his world-conquering rampage. But one of the greatest generals in the ancient world was also the Empress of Ethiopia. This was the formidable Black Queen Candace. World famous as a military tactician and field commander, legend has it that Alexander could not entertain even the possibility of having his world fame and unbroken chains of victories marred by risking a defeat at last by a woman. So he halted his armies at the borders of Ethiopia and did not invade to meet the waiting black armies with their queen in personal command. Upon his death, one of his most outstanding generals became Pharaoh as Ptolemy I. And thus began 300 years of Macedonian Greek rule. Toward the end of Greek domination, the expansion of the Roman Empire had transferred the real center of power to Rome, Assyria, Persia, Greece, Rome. The continuing process of transforming a black civilization into a near white civilization long before the Christian era. The Ptolemaic period had been largely one of confusion. The division of power among Greeks, Macedonians, and Egyptians, intermarriages with the latter, joint rule, etc., made the Ptolemies at times merely nominal rulers. There were times when a native Afro-Asian ruler gained the center of the stage as the star attraction, as in the case of Cleopatra. Upon her death, Romans assumed direct control, 30 BC, and ruled the country for seven centuries, beginning, therefore, just 30 years before Jesus Christ was born in the same Palestine where blacks had lived and also ruled so long. After this long period of domination, the Arab general Amir ibn al-As entered Alexandria in 642 AD with only 4,000 men. The conquest of Egypt by Muslim armies, which had reached Pelusium two years earlier, was not only to change the character of Egyptian civilization radically, but it was to have a disastrous impact on the dignity and destiny of Africans as a people. The Arab conquest had opened the floodgates wider, and Arabs poured in. Colonization and Islamization progressed, and as Egypt became a main center of Arab power, this fact found concrete expression in Arab Islamic expansion over North Africa, into Spain, and southward into what remained as the land of the blacks. The New Borderline of the Blacks We have traced the ancient struggles between Africans, 
mulattoes, and Asians. Struggle on the part of Africans not only to resist conquest, but to retake the whole of Egypt. They succeeded at times, as has been shown. They finally lost all of Egypt, as we have also seen. Ethiopia now began at the first cataract in the north and extended south into present-day Ethiopia. It was now bounded by Upper Egypt, the Red Sea, and the Libyan Desert. These are rather general geographical designations without any precise meaning, for ancient Ethiopia had no precise southern boundaries. Ancient Ethiopians would say that their land included Egypt and was in fact without boundaries in Africa insofar as non-Africans were concerned. All of the European and Asian doctrines about quote, unoccupied regions of Africa at any given period in history is quite meaningless and unacceptable to Africans, for to them it is just as senseless as it would be to say to a farmer anywhere. See here now, there are large sections of your land unoccupied and untended, so we'll just come in and take it. The Africans' area of great concentration then was ancient Nubia between the first and the sixth cataracts. It was the land where they continued to develop the great civilization after that which they had extended over Egypt had been appropriated by the invaders as their own handiwork. The geography of Nubia is the geography of much of the present-day Sudan and beyond. The Nile flows through its sand and rock deserts with a series of falls and a number of rapids. The country is almost rainless. It is the land of the great Nubian desert. West of the Nile towards the Red Sea was the mining area, especially gold. It was, even within the concept of these geographical boundaries, the heartland of the black world. Already pushed by the invaders from the Mediterranean areas in the north, northeast, and northwest, the Africans were to be further hedged in from the east and southeast as the Asian hordes continued to stream across the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean, and much later, as the Dutch Boers poured in from the southernmost tip of the continent. Scraps from Prehistory the Stone Age Africans lived about the same as Stone Age peoples all over the world. They were hunters, fishermen, and craftsmen. Archaeologists have dug up some of their tools and other artifacts at Wadi Halfa, Wawa, Sai Island, Wadi Hudi, the Salima Oasis, Tangasi, Tagaya, and other places. Those mentioned are between the second and fourth cataracts. Our discussion of specific concrete evidence of early black civilization up to this point has been confined to the Egyptian north. Most notable among the Neolithic finds in the south were the beautiful, highly burnished, black-topped and red pottery bowls, jars, etc. All pottery was artistically decorated in wavy ripples or squares. Their earliest writing was in pictures, so many hundreds of these rock messages were found along the Nile through Nubia land that one may well wonder if these prehistoric historians had posterity in mind. For while many of the pictures portrayed wildlife and other objects of interest in the environment, Others went beyond this role of the artist and recorded such historic facts as the conquest of northern Nubia by a Nubian pharaoh of the Old Kingdom. Neferu in 2730 BC Footnote There was a previous reference to Neferu's quote, scorched earth war in his own home 
to further illustrate the extreme southern opposition to integration with the Asians even under black kings. End of footnote. This war left a vast wasteland and practically wiped out a civilization that had been developing before Neolithic times. The Children of the Sun For one thing, the land to the south of Egypt had developed a strong economy that was continuously enriched by a thriving export trade in paper from papyrus, ivory, gold, ebony, emeralds, copper, incense, ostrich feathers, always greatly in demand, and its famous decorated earthenware. A strong economy also meant a strong Ethiopian army that posed a threat even to an African-ruled Egypt. From the Egyptian viewpoint, the land of the blacks was a threefold threat. Historically, the blacks who had fled below the first cataract to escape the various conquests never seemed to accept those conquests as final and attempted to retake Egypt from time to time. These repetitions are deliberate because nowhere in history is this very important fact clearly stated. But it is clear that having reconquered the Asian dominated Lower Egypt, the black pharaohs sought integration with the Asians instead of driving them out of the country. This policy of moderation and accommodation was apparently anathema to the extremist Ethiopians. Proud blacks for whom the prospects of having their children come into the world with a color distinctly different from their own was at once an insult to the dignity of every African man, an insult to their watching ancestors, and an offense to the gods themselves. This attitude might also explain the hostility of the southern blacks toward the Afro-Asian. The latter were not true Africans because they were becoming Egyptians, a mixed breed of many races. They were therefore traitors in the eyes of the true Africans whose badge of eternal honor was the blackness of their skin. This was color racism deeply rooted for it sprang from religion. They were quote, children of the sun blessed with the blackness by the sun god himself and thus protected from his fiery rays. They were his children. Their very blackness therefore was religious, a blessing and an honor. The second already stated threat was economic. Egypt's own flourishing export trade, both by sea and caravans, depended heavily on her imports from the south. To cut these off would mean economic panic in an otherwise prosperous land. The third great fear concerned the mighty Nile River. Suppose the Ethiopians decided to bring Egypt to her knees and starve her to death by diverting the waters of the Nile. Belief in this possibility was ancient and ran deep. The Egyptian conquest of Nubia therefore might remove the military and economic threats, but in so far as the Nile was concerned, it would settle nothing. Besides, these blacks seemed to be unconquerable. A Neferu might attempt total extermination of the population, burn every town and village, destroy farms and cattle, and leave the land in utter ruin. Yet, as soon as the armies of destruction withdrew, the surviving Africans came out from their hiding places and began to rebuild once again. Like Upper Egypt, this was a land of cities and towns, of temples and pyramids. Africans were the great pyramid builders, the temple builders. They had built the great pyramids of Egypt during their rule. So there was renewed activity in temple building after Nubia was reoccupied by the 18th dynasty rulers. All this renewed zeal in building new towns and temples in the south was reconstruction. The old kingdom raiders could not destroy all of the temples and other monuments. The returning Egyptians, therefore, had found many fine temples still in use, others in ruins. 
all Ethiopian inscriptions on the temples and monuments were erased and Egyptian inscriptions substituted. Any outstanding African creations that could not be converted and claimed as the work of Egyptians were destroyed. For now, Egyptian meant white, Asian or European. This was done to, quote, promote national unity. Ethiopian inscriptions, of course, recorded victories over Egypt. The Arabs were to carry out the work of eradication in a far more thoroughgoing manner at a later time. All of the South was never completely conquered. The reconquest we are now discussing extended 40 or 50 miles below Abu Hamed. History continued to repeat itself. Below the area of conquest, the Africans continued to rebuild, reorganizing their fighting forces and watching an overextended Egypt become weaker and weaker under weak pharaohs who were unable to cope with the interminable struggle for power among the Asians, Egyptians, and other incursive groups. In these cycles of consolidation and then fragmentation into numerous chiefdoms and principalities, Egypt mirrored the results of the human power craze not only in Africa but generally throughout the world. Yet in the long view of her history, Egypt's overall record was one of consolidation and unity that was at times not seriously broken during a thousand years. Napata was a beautiful city that was favored by surroundings that helped to make it so. Located below the fourth cataract, above the great curve where the Nile had turned southward and, as though changing its mind, turned north again, an imposing hill, the quote, throne of the sun god, was the site of temples. The city itself was regarded as the Holy of Holies, the capital of what the Egyptians call the land of the gods. But Napata referred not only to this central city but included what today we would call a metropolitan area that covered towns and villages for miles in all directions from the present-day town of Karima. It was to this area that African leaders, including priests of the various cults, retreated when things got too hot in Egypt. Here also, certain African kings preferred to stay even when their position and power in Egypt were unchallenged. Most of the royal burials and pyramids were at Kuru. The largest pyramid in Ethiopia is that of King Taharka at Nori. After the Assyrian Greek invasion in 590 BC, the city was almost completely destroyed again. The capital now moved on the other side of the river to the other historic industrial center at Miro. The blacks apparently had been more concerned with the development of their copper industry than with iron. Iron ore in abundance was all around. Their failure to exploit it earlier, especially for military weapons, was the reason Assyrians with their superior iron weapons were able to sweep them out of Egypt and even invade the heartland and destroy the holy city of Napata. The Africans had long since learned the use of iron. They knew all about the smelting process. Why then did they allow the Assyrians to get ahead of them? Even granting that the ancients kept their military developments as secret as nations try to do today, it is also true that spies, including Africans, were active everywhere. The question is interesting because we are not discussing the period when the African had ultimately surrendered to despair and retrogression, but a period of African power, high civilization, and a greatness that had the respect and fear of the ancient world. 
even after the onslaught by the Assyrians and their allies, the Africans were to rebuild from the new capital city of Moreau a civilization greater than the one just destroyed. There were many lesser states and countless small chiefdoms in the vast landmass that began where the effective control by Ethiopia ended. Through all these millenniums of ups and downs, of trials and errors, of great victories and disastrous defeats, through it all the central drive of this once all-black land was in the direction of consolidation and progress. Tribes were united into one nation, either voluntarily or that failing by force. Strong armies were maintained to protect and expand their civilization. The retaking of that part of the homeland that extended north along the Nile to the Mediterranean was at once the deathless dream, the impassioned goal, and the cornerstone of their foreign policy. So these Africans battled the invading Asians decade after decade, after century after century until their resistance to conquest and enslavement extended over 4,000 years. From ancient days, therefore, the Africans had had, in the very center of the heartland on the continent, a history from which their posterity could learn how unity alone provides the conditions for strength and progress, and that each one of a thousand little Quote, independent chieftains is but a standing invitation to the aggressors and ultimate domination for all. Why did the Africans fail to take this message of salvation as a revealed truth from their own history? What dimmed civilization's light on Barkhal Hill and caused an ultimate withdrawal to the bush and the scattering of people hither and yon like hunted beasts? Why did Africans begin to retire from the race with other advancing peoples and fall so far behind that even the memory of former greatness could not inspire a revival because that memory had been almost completely blotted out? I have been detailing with some of the answers throughout the lecture series in later chapters we shall explore further answers to questions raised and unanswered. We now cross to the west bank of the Nile and journey farther south to the city of Moreau. It is the 8th century BC and the move to Moreau was simply to move to what was already the southern capital and that now instead of having two capital cities in the south there would be only one the development of writing. A distinguished line of leaders followed Tanutamon to the throne in 653 BC at Lanursa, Sen Kamen Tedkin, and Laman as Palta, Amtalka, and Malenakan, palace, temple, and pyramid builders, all. Two of the greatest temples were built by King Espalta at Moreau, the Sun Temple, and the Temple of Amun. Footnote It is believed that the Temple to Amun was not completed during Espalta's lifetime, but by his successors. End of footnote The imposing pyramids and rows of huge royal statues added to the majesty and magnificence of Moreau. The royal tombs, as in Egypt, were the repositories of the nation's history. For it was from these tombs that the archaeologists were able to determine a line of 41 rulers after the conquest of Lower Nubia. These monuments were not only sources of early African history from within, but of the highest importance 
they were elaborately decorated outside with both the first form of writing hieroglyphics and the more advanced African inscriptions in their own invented writing for the Africans themselves had invented writing and all attempts to connect this ancient achievement with Egyptian or Asiatic influence have failed here the quote external influence school has suffered a major defeat because the written records found on statues altars tombstones graffiti etc were so distinctly African that their native origin could not be successfully disputed moreover the African system of writing was very different from the Egyptian it was simpler and had vowels whereas Egyptian had none there were 23 characters or letters in the African alphabet four vowel signs 17 consonants and two signs of the syllable new concepts and new or special words could be easily introduced by the old picture system clarity and easy reading was assured by measured spacing between words there was developed a system of numerical symbols for mathematics the African inscriptions on monuments and such records as those found in royal tombs are in a special category general writing was done on tablets of wood and skins prepared for that purpose still other artifacts with ancient African writing were found on such things as rocks walls vases and broken bits and pieces of earthenware again how and why did all this disappear how and why was it blotted out or hidden so completely for two thousand years that an ignorant world with unprecedented research facilities in its universities still believes teaches and proclaims that the black man never developed a civilization of his own it has been noted that the attractions of Ethiopia were great not only because the Egyptians regarded it as the main source of their religion the land of the gods but also because of its socio political economic and strategic importance when African kings reconquered Egypt and became Egyptian pharaohs they still longed for the motherland to the south desired to unite the whole of it with Egypt into one vast empire often retired there and some wanted their final resting place to be in a pyramid below the first cataract here rested their ancestors whose company they were to join here was the capital city of both the black man's world and that of his heaven as well the holy city of Napata so during the different periods in which Napata came under a foreign yoke the capital city of Moro had to become somewhat holy in its own right and many of the kings queens and other leaders were buried in pyramids there these were constructed of stone outside of the city proper sometimes at a visible distance of two or more miles they were built to stand forever an attempt that stemmed from the Africans actual belief in immortality this is why their faith included the natural assumption that those who had passed on their ancestors were living in the great beyond and were therefore in the most favorable position to represent the interests of their kinsmen below or in short to serve as mediators between God and man the pyramids ringing the city not only added to the physical beauty of the surroundings but they were also the silent sentinels the ever watchful ancestral presence from which might come either a benediction or a curse earlier you may recall I was unsparing in my criticism of those African societies which seemed to be governed by fatalism and failed to counterattack against their enemies both natural and human as I read the record it seemed to me that these groups did not try to meet the awful challenges with which they were confronted gave up too readily refused to ignore tribal lines and unite 
for survival strategies, but scattered here and there like hunting animals, and into barbarism and savagery. Such were my strictures, and obviously I did not give the whole story even about these groups. Just now, however, and by a glorious contrast, we are in the midst of blacks, the core group of all Africa, who met the challenge on all fronts and from every direction, and who fought on and on through the centuries against the forces of both man and nature until they were completely overwhelmed. Three thousand years ago the desert, while slowly moving in on Africa, had not advanced where it is today. There was, therefore, more arable land in Ethiopia, although its agriculture did not match that of the rich delta region of Egypt. The blacks were, however, mainly agriculturalists like other Africans. Even with their remarkable industrial development, farming went on both sides of the two Niles, which meant in their land before continuing as one great river through Egypt to the Mediterranean Sea. Nor should the importance of the Akbara River be overlooked, even though the surrounding deserts were a problem in so far as agricultural expansion was desired. The more immediate problem was famine from drought. There were years during which no rain fell at all, and not a hopeful cloud appeared in the sky. The Africans met the challenge by constructing a national system of reservoirs. These were strategically located around the capital at Musawarat. Naga, Hordan, Um, Usuda, in the Gezira region, at Duanib, Basa, and doubtlessly at other sites not yet excavated. This master plan to defeat drought and famine, this system of reservoirs, was more important than all of the architectural art that found expression in their beautiful statues, temples, palaces, columns, and pyramids. The reservoirs were more significant than the monuments, important as these were in hiding the black man's intellectual achievements in the invention of writing deep under the sands. I rate the reservoirs as the supreme achievement because they reflect the real measure of African man as he met the challenge to survival head on, with a constructive counterattack against the adverse forces of earth, sun, and sky. The irrigation system, made reasonably effective with their oxen powered wheels, was a part of this challenge to adverse circumstances. The Yankee, following Kashta in 720 BC, began what was quickly to become again one of the greatest world powers of the time. For this time, Ethiopia was united with Afro-Asian Egypt under a single imperial rule that extended from the Mediterranean in the north to an undefined boundary in the south. Also unknown is how far did its eastern boundary extend southward along the Indian Ocean coastland, how much of Uganda and Abyssinia was included, or how far westward did the empire extend. Footnote: This whole period of black achievements is minimized by writers who substitute Moreau, the city, for Ethiopia, the empire. Ethiopian writing then becomes, quote, some Meroetic inscriptions, etc. And the footnote. All this is not so important as the point that during this period of triumph, world fame and fear, and unprecedented prosperity from a flourishing trade with about one half of the world, for long periods African rulers continued to neglect the updating of their military and naval defenses. Iron was the basis of the technological revolution in warfare that the Assyrians, Hittites, 
Persians and other Asiatic nations were equipping their armies with new type iron weapons and that these were devastatingly more effective than stone and copper weapons had to be well known to the Africans and it was not news as mentioned before they not only knew about the uses of iron but they had long since developed the iron smelting process the trouble was the highly secretive royal monopoly no secret was more zealously guarded than the smelting of iron this meant rigidly limited production here was fear outmatching both reason and the most elementary common sense this over secretiveness which inhibited the expansion of iron production was to contribute mightily to the success of Assyrian arms over them prosperity too may have blurred the African vision too much success can be dangerous in this case so much wealth was being piled up from foreign trade especially in gold ivory and copper that the question of iron if raised may have been dismissed as economically unsound whatever the reasons were the fact is that the great iron industries which developed in this center and spread over Africa could have started centuries before they did even as early as 300 BC when iron smelting was for more useful purposes than ornaments the royal monopoly still prevented widespread use that they knew of the importance of iron is shown by the fact that kings and high priests were often heads of the guild and the chief iron master might become prime minister not an African title but no matter about the delay iron smelting and tool making got underway on a vast scale in Ethiopia at a most crucial period for Africa its center was Moro and it appears that the biggest iron works were in and around this capital city this development was at a crucial period because it was the period of increasing migrations from the heartland and the scattering of groups all over Africa they carried their knowledge of this great technological revolution wherever they went and they began the use of iron and the development of iron industries wherever they had the opportunity to settle in iron ore areas and remain settled long enough to create a stable society this spread of iron working from the cradle of black civilization is just another example of how other fundamental African institutions spread over the continent north as well as south and remained basically unchanged down through the centuries no matter how numerous were the groups into which the original society became fragmented or how countless were the various languages and dialects that resulted from that segmentation there were as a matter of course many variations and modifications by different survival groups the most remarkable of the facts was that even those groups that were pushed back into a state of barbarism still held on God only knows how to some of the basic institutions of the society from which they descended from one to two thousand years before nor was either Christian Europe or Muslim Asia able to destroy those institutions completely even in the vast regions over which both had supreme control and this is why in a previous talk I suggested a smile of compassion when you read or hear about quote Egyptian influence on this or that black society because in general all that could possibly be meant is the quote influence of early black civilization on subsequent black societies the expansion of the iron culture however was a revolution in technology that ushered in a new age and gave new hope to a despairing people it meant the use of new instruments of production in agriculture 
the industrial crafts and of great importance for a refugee people, for a new kind of military organization and defense. It can be seen that the motherland of the blacks centered on the Nile around the cataracts provided her wandering sons and daughters with the instruments of survival, a knowledge that still served them well centuries after the Arabs and Turks had, had overrun that motherland. The memory of many things had been lost, however. Who remembered Thebes, Napata, Memphis, Elephantine, Heracleopolis, or Nekeb? Indeed, who remembered even Miro, the most advanced center, not only of the African Iron Age, but also of writing? And what of the other important towns and cities in southern Ethiopia, Nubia Kush, Musawaret, Nori, Panopolis, Kerma, Aswan, Soleb, Abu Simbel, Kurusku, Samna, Fale, Kawa, Dangola, etc. Our constant references to Napata and Moro might lead those who do not look at the map to think that there were only two important cities in the land. Forgetting the names of ancient centers of importance was nothing compared to the tragedy of the blacks and forgetting, almost completely forgetting, the very art of writing which they themselves invented. This was one of the most tragic losses, to repeat, that was ever suffered by a whole people, and in view of the anti-black course of subsequent history, the blacks needed their written language and records more than any people. Just how and why this people discontinued the use of writing has been set forth rather clearly and in some detail in foregoing pages. However, the matter is of such transcendent importance that I hope that some black scholar will devote an entire book to detailing just this one episode in the long history of Africans. From long drawn out situations and circumstances, when writing was so needless as to be out of the question, to a general disuse for lack of need, to a general loss of the art itself, that is the story. I say general loss again because, of course, some African societies did not completely lose the art of writing, even under conditions where its use seemed utterly futile. The most important fact to keep in mind, however, is that we are considering the early age when relatively only a few people could write, a small professional class, the scribes. All books, scrolls, inscriptions, letters, etc. were written by them. Therefore, in any society where the scribes were either captured or disappeared from it, for whatever reason, the art of writing in that society died. In view of the developments in black Africa, the disappearance of writing is not a mystery at all. Conquest and domination tended to check migrations and bring a larger measure of iron rule stability in the invaded regions. An integral part of that iron rule was the introduction of the conqueror's speech and writing, the first step in the process of conquering both the soul and minds of the blacks along with their bodies. This was easy because the knowledge-starved, quote, key people among the blacks eagerly grasped Arabic, French, Portuguese, English, or German as the best route to status in a new civilization. Most of this developed later than the period we have been summarizing. The thousand years in Ethiopia after its last success in retaking Egypt and its defeat and withdrawal with the fall of the 25th dynasty. That is the period from the 6th century BC to the 4th century of the Christian Church in Ethiopia. Christian Africa 
Africa was naturally among the first areas to which Christianity spread. It was next door to Palestine, and from the earliest times there had been the closest relations between the Jews and the blacks, both friendly and hostile. The exchange of pre-Christian religious concepts took place easily, and due to the residence of so many ancient Jewish leaders in Ethiopia, almost naturally, Abraham, Joseph, and brothers, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, and, of course, the great lawgiver, Moses, who was not only born in Africa, but married the daughter of an African priest. Footnotes Many accounts refer only to his marriage to the daughter of a Midianite priest. However, Aaron and his wife rebuked Moses for marrying a black woman. End of footnote. The pathway for the early Christian church in the land of the blacks had been made smooth many centuries before. In a different work, I suggested that a major reason why so many later Christian missionaries failed in Africa was because they were bringing refurbished religious doctrines that came from Africa in the first place. The religious belief in sacrifice for the remission of sins was an African belief and practice at least 2,000 years before Abraham. The results of a comparative study of the African, Jewish, and Christian religions have amazed many who have undertaken the task. Practically all of the Ten Commandments were embedded in the African Constitution ages before Moses went up Mount Sinai in Africa in 1491 BC, a rather late date in African history. We do not know how much significance should be read into the fact that Christianity began to spread in Ethiopia, Nubia or Kush. Only after the destruction of the central empire with the fall of Moreau. However, the most important development after the empire passed was not the rise of Christianity, but the rise of the two black states that picked up the mantle and staff of Ethiopia to carry on. These two states were Makuria and Alwa. <laughs>